Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us again after lunch here in Hong Kong. Uh, I'm so delighted to be joined by friendly faces from all around the region. Once again, we had a great morning sessions, uh, again on Hong Kong time with our opening remarks with uh, Laura Lane and with Dr. Rebecca from the APEC Secretariat. Uh, Laura Lane also from UPS and the ABAC, which is APEC Business Advisory Council for USA 2023, followed by a plenary session where we had, we were hearing from US senior advisors for APEC and government officials and ABAC members, uh, representatives from across the region in New Zealand, Thailand, uh, and Canada. So uh, I'm delighted now uh, after our last session, which was on supply chains, ESG, uh, decarbonization, and looking ahead uh, from a geopolitical point of view, we're moving now into the realm of water security, water scarcity, water management, everything about water. Uh, and we've got a wonderful panel of experts to talk about this subject. So for the next hour, sit back and enjoy while I hand over to our chair for this session, Dr. Parag. Agawal. Thank you, Dr. Parag. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, it is such a pleasure, privilege, and an honor to be uh, to be chairing this session on, on a subject that is so, so dear to my heart. Uh, personally, uh, you know, and, and it's it's almost a mission that um, uh, you know I personally have embarked upon. And thank you for to all my panelists at the outset for making the time to be here. Uh, you know, um, uh, the problem of water or water as a problem needs no introduction. It's it's something that we all listen to, we read about, we hear about, we, I, we even experience in so many ways, uh, uh, you know, in our daily lives and in the lives of people around us. Yet, you know, the, the, the problem persists and somehow we've always, um, you know, uh, we've always seen, um, you know, administrations, governments, and the, those uh, in power that they may be gloss over the problem and simply try and um, you know say or uh, do other things to try and solve the water problem. For example, my favorite line is, uh, you know, as governments of the day um, levying twenty five p on a plastic bag to to try and address the water problem. So you know things like that. You know there are there are so many things that we see and you know none of them are really. Um, focused at the consumer, I'd like to say, yes, it's all important. I think water is, the, is one of the problems that is uh, that requires a multilateral, a multi-skilled and a multi-pronged approach when it comes to solving it. You know, there are macro, sub-macro, micro, and then sub-micro issues, all of which need to be resolved in one go. And, you know, I, of course, um, tend to be a little biased from the drinking water uh, situation because that's the sector I for that's the part of the sector which I focus on and uh, continue to work to try and make safe drinking water available to communities um, to people um, you know um, in a, in an affordable manner. Of course, I am the least uh, I dare say I am the least qualified on this panel, and I would not like to take up too much time. Um, you know, we have some very very eminent, experienced, and um, enriched panelists and uh, who would I, I would like to invite immediately into this con uh, conversation. And um, le let me start by uh, requesting uh, Ms. Yasmin Siddiqui to come in. Um, you know, I'd like, I request you to kindly introduce yourselves and make an, you know, you know, present your opening comments, your, your thoughts, your views. I'm sure everyone here is going to absolutely soak it all up. Uh, pun intended, no pun intended. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, and greetings to all who've joined us today in the audience. It's uh, really truly an honor to be here um, as part of this webinar, which, um, in my opinion, covers one of the most critical subjects today on water scarcity. Um, I'm Yasmin Siddiqui, and I'm the Director for Environment, Agriculture, and Natural Resources for the Asian Development Bank. Um, for many of you who may not be familiar, the Asian Development Bank is a development bank covering the Asia and the Pacific region. Um, we're committed to achieving prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we were established in 1966. We're owned by 68 members, which are our member countries, and 49 of those are from our region. 
So maybe just uh, to frame it, uh, Dr. Agarwal, um, of course, as a development bank, supporting financing and um, investments, knowledge um, and technical assistance um, in the region, we are very much committed to uh, firstly understanding our region's challenges in the water sector. And for the Asia Pacific region, perhaps I can just start off with climate change, which is primarily um, being felt through the water uh, cycle intensification. And our region um, accounts for, importantly, 40% of disasters which are tri uh, triggered by natural hazards. And 84% of the people of our region are impacted by those disasters. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the recent devastating floods that have been experienced in Pakistan, which drive home the challenges of climate change and disaster. Uh, secondly, food security. Agriculture consumes 70% of our region's freshwater resources, and the growing demand for food will increase pressure on water resources in, in this context. Uh, tuning into what you just mentioned about water supply, a shocking statistic, 500 million people are without access to basic water supplies in our region, and 1.14 billion people without access to sanitation. I'm probably going to stop there because I think those figures in themselves are quite alarming um, and, and really drive home those major challenges for our region. Thank you. Dr. Parag, you're on uh, mute. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Asmin. Uh, you know, startling numbers absolutely makes us throw our head back and, um, you know, um, lower our eyes in terms of, you know, what the world is moving towards. And, you know, I think only add to the de determination that we want to really make a difference. I think the one thing I'd like to, you know, also say here and add to what you said is it's very important for the world to understand the classification between water and safe water. And both of them are deemed to be similar, but they're as different as chalk is from cheese. And this is something that also we need to highlight in terms of education. We are doing it in our own little way. And, uh, you know, I think a, a, a narrative, a, some, a, a very a broad narrative coming across from everyone also needs to go out where people understand the difference. I think uh, the, the, equating the two is doing actually a disservice to people. So anyways, uh, moving on, um, I'd like to invite uh, Catherine Cross. Catherine, you're, uh, you know, she's from the Australian, uh, uh, the Australian Water Partnership. And, uh, you know, uh, Catherine, please come in and, uh, you know, please introduce yourself and, um, you know, enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Craig. And thank you uh, again to the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this, um, this panel. Um, yeah, so I'm Catherine Cross. I'm the strategy and partnership lead with the Australian Water Partnership based in uh, Canberra in Australia. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Australian Water Partnership, um, we're an organization that was um, initiated by the Australian government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, we aim to match Australian water management expertise with international development needs to build a water for development community in our region and beyond. So our region is the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we provide design and advisory services alongside grants to partners and consortia for priority water management activities in developing countries with, um, with funding, as I said, from, from DFAT. Um, and our partners include both, both Australian partners, but also international partners, including the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, and FAO, among others, um, as well as um, in, countries, uh, uh, in country partners across the region. Um, perhaps just building on what, um, what Yasmin uh, mentioned um, about some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of um, water in the region. Obviously, um, climate change is, is um, increasing and the impacts are affecting, affecting us worldwide, but um, especially in Asia Pacific with recent floods, um, as was mentioned in Pakistan, but um, also in Australia. And Australia has, uh, has been experiencing these extremes between, between floods and droughts. And in order to be able to manage these effectively into the future, information is key. Um, and so is transparency. So 
using the evidence base to plan for the future is, is needed. And um, that, that this includes um, obviously scientific evidence. Um, so data from, from everything from on the ground sensors uh, to earth observation, but it also um, is beyond this conventional uh, knowledge. It also means uh, including traditional and community knowledge. Dr. Prague, you mentioned the impact um, and the importance of, of safe water. Um, and so we have to consider the views and perspective of those that are experiencing some of these climate change impacts, some of these, some of these problems and issues that Yasmin mentioned. Um, so in integrating their knowledge into how we respond and how we, we plan for the future is essential. Um, so I actually just came back from the UN Climate Change Conference and um, Throughout that event, there were, throughout that event, um, there were two things I want to mention. One is the importance of including gendered perspectives, but also community and traditional knowledge, um, especially th that from indigenous pe people. There are thousands of years and generations of experiencing experience on adapting to climate change, which needs to be understood and listened to. Um, the second thing, which I think was also alluded to, was the importance of connecting the different sectors. Um, I think this has been repeated over and over again, but we need to break the silos and ensure that there is an understanding of how one sector impacts another. So Yasmin mentioned the issues around um, water security and, and also food security. Um, there's also the, the um, link to energy and um, this multi-sectoral, multi-dimensional approach is needed to really address these problems. So, for example, um, one, as I said, one sector can impact another. For, so there's a high reliance on water and energy production. Uh, for example, thermal energy needs water for cooling and hydropower needs flows. At the same time, water production can require intense energy demands. Um, so there are opportunities to implement alternative approaches and solutions um, through technology, but also through nature-based solutions, um, through social um, innovations. Um, so at the same time, um, with with the climate crisis, that, that 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 brings opportunities, and we can use that opportunity to break some of these silos and, and link these sectors together more effectively. So I'll, I'll stop there. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Catherine. Uh, you know, extremely uh, extremely broad perspective indeed, and uh, you know, uh, it, while it, it's very important to understand. Um, you know, how the water problem or the scarcity of water uh, applies to each one of those and managing water in different sectors is also important to eventually manage water at, at the base of the pyramid. But uh, having said that, yes, um, uh, lots to be done, lots needs to be done. But uh, um, again, we, I go back to that multi-pronged, multilateral, multi-skilled approach. That, that is required to address it. So, you know, thank you for all the work that yourselves are doing and for uh, for these uh, thoughts that you just shared with us. Uh, I'd, uh, I'll take the liberty of going to Dr. Mio last. Uh, you know, we'll allow the ladies uh, the, uh, and the third lady on the panel to speak. Um, Bernice Woods, uh, you know, uh, uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to have you here, an independent consultant, uh, someone who is... Uh, an adjunct fellow at the Asia Business Council, and uh, you know is here to share uh, you know share her thoughts with us. Uh, please come in, Bernice, and uh, introduce yourself and take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Parag. Uh, well, so so uh, first of all, thank you very much for for inviting me. I think as as everyone mentioned and, and highlighted so far, I mean, water uh, conservation is a critical topic, and so uh, I'm very pleased to be part of the conversation that we're having today uh, on that. Uh, so, I mean, very briefly, I think you've you've already introduced me. I'm a I'm an adjunct fellow at the uh, Asia Business Council, uh, and for those who do not know, uh, the Asia Business Council, it's an uh, Asian CEO organization. Uh, I am also working as an independent consultant advising uh, companies on their sustainability and risk management strategies. Uh, and finally, I'm involved in the delivery of a number of uh, executive uh, education courses uh, on sustainable corporations uh, at Oxford University. Um, so, um, in terms of, of my comments, I think uh, Parag, we, we spoke a little bit before this panel and you asked me to, uh, to, to provide a business perspective. 
So I'll be looking at, you know, uh, Catherine mentioned that uh, we need to take a multi-dimensional approach. So I'll be looking at one of the aspects of that, uh, which is what companies can do uh, in terms of, of preserving uh, water resources and why they should do that. So, so just a, a little bit of context. Uh, I mean, as we all know, and as, as has been highlighted already, uh, water is a critical uh, natural resource. Uh, it, it's, it's essentially uh, supporting uh, life on Earth. Uh, but what most people uh, do not necessarily understand uh, is that water also underpins uh, most economic activities. So every company uh, at some point uh, in their value chain either directly or uh, indirectly uh, depends on water. Uh, and as such, uh, they also have an impact on water. So uh, for some companies, uh, the, the, the impacts and dependencies are very direct. So for instance, if you're uh, operating uh, in agriculture uh, or in mining, or if you're involved in, in producing uh, inputs for the textile industry, uh, you're very much aware of, of how you depend on water. Uh, but for most companies, uh, the, these impacts and dependencies are, are, are mostly indirect. So it's a bit like scope three emissions for carbon. Uh, and so, for instance, if you take a bank or an, an insurance company, uh, they use a lot of data. And so for data, you need uh, data centers. Uh, and so to power a data center, typically you need between uh, 11 uh, and 19 million liters of water uh, per day, uh, which is you know, the equivalent consumption of, uh, of what an average city of 100 to 200,000 uh, household uh, will need. Uh, if you want to look at something that's even more indirect, uh, you have semiconductors. Uh, every company, uh, every uh, company that provides uh, products or services uh, is dependent uh, on technology. Uh, and technology is dependent on semiconductors. Uh, and so a typical chip fab uh, will uh, consume uh, up to 40 million liters of water per day. So again, that's the, you know, that's equivalent to the consumption of uh, roughly 300,000 households. So water is a, a critical input uh, for business. Uh, and, and, and as, uh, you know, the population continues to increase, uh, economic activities continue to grow. And, and so the consequence of that is that, you know, business uh, use uh, more and more water. Uh, and so in, in a context where, uh, uh, where fresh water resources are increasingly scarce, uh, that certainly uh, deserves attention. So, so just to conclude, I think it's uh, in this, you know, with, with this in mind, it's, it's really important that companies uh, acknowledge uh, and understand how they use water uh, and find ways to uh, change uh, their engagement with water. And so I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you, Bernice. Yes, um, uh, you know, the, um, the role of corporates, uh, for the longest I have said, uh, CSR, which is typically corporate social responsibility, sh uh, should actually be redefined into corporate sur uh, survival responsibility. Uh, you know, no more do companies need to wait to turn profitable uh, to then go out and do community service projects uh, in the water space. Uh, they need to start look if they intend to turn profitable, they must undertake these projects. So, you know, uh, so ESG and CSR, of course, are big contributors to any work that happens on ground. And um, yeah, so it's great. And thank you for bringing in that perspective here. Um, last but not the least, but, uh, you know, and Dr. Mio Zin, uh, you know, representing UNICEF, you know, needs no introduction as an organization, pretty much, uh, you know, working on the ground for decades now. And I think UNICEF has really set the benchmark for so many other organizations in the world to emulate. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Mio, to, for being here. Uh, you know, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azarwa. Uh, warm greetings from Bangkok. My name is Mio. Uh, I'm the Deputy Regional Director of UNICEF East Asia and the Pacific Regional Office based in Bangkok. Uh, Dr. Agarwal said uh, we don't need introduction for UNICEF, but let me uh, say a few words about UNICEF. UNICEF uh, is in ex uh, existence for 77 years, and we are one of the UN agencies. And also our focus is on the centrality, is on the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So we are a UN agency, as well as a defender and promoter of uh, 
rights of the child. And we have 183 offices globally uh, working on child rights, uh, on child health, nutrition, education, water sanitation, hygiene, climate, and also on the child protection. So these are our key areas of support um, in, in the, with the UNICEF in the country offices, as uh, our moderator rightly said, we are on the ground, we, we, we have our hands dirty, so we need to wash uh, water uh, to, to have a, a support for the children. Uh, this panel is also very timely uh, discussion because uh, World Health Organization, WHO, the World Bank and UNICEF, we recently published a report last month called the State of the World's Drinking Water, an urgent call for attention and action to accelerate progress on ensuring safe drinking water for all. This is the first of its kind, the report itself. And the report stated that uh, the SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goal number six, the 6.1 target is by 2030, we achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water for all. So in the last two decades, the report highlighted that, you know, we made some investment in the drinking water and uh, there, there, there is evidence that's considerable increases in access for instance, nowadays we have 75% of the global population have access to safely managed drinking water compared to 62% 20 years ago. Despite the progress, there are wide geographical disparities, as you all know, and 2 billion people today still do not have access to safely managed drinking water. And the world is not even close to meet the SDG goal by, by 2030 on, on the safe and clean water. So, definitely acceleration is needed. And the birth to achieve our SDG on water is much threatened by the impacts of climate change. My other panelists mentioned already the competing agricultural, ecological water needs, and also competing financial priorities in a challenging world. And of course, the challenges of uh, threats to water quality. So these are issues that blocking us to achieve uh, our SDG goal on water by 2030 and we need to triple, quadruple our efforts. I want to zoom a bit on uh, the, the region, the East Asia and Pacific region. It's a, it's a, it's a very large region with a, with a huge uh, population. And also the region is, is a mixture of uh, first growing economies, plus we still have a least developed country. So it's, it's a mixed uh, uh, economies in the region. Over the past decade, the region saw some of the reduction in the poverty, but challenges of the COVID, the climate, and the conflict in the region have really overturned uh, our results. As uh, Yasmin mentioned, 500 million people still do not have access to, to clean water. And as you may know, pneumonia and diarrhea remain the biggest killers for children under the age of five in this region. Water scarcity and inability to access clean and safe water are underlying factors for the child morbidity and mortality in the region. I want to focus a bit on a link of the different SDGs. So SDG on water is also linked to SDG on health, SDG on education. So water scarcity affects the child health and development. When a child got sick with diarrhea due to water scarcity or access to, to unclean water only, and the, 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 the stomach cannot really absorb the nutrition. And as the repeated diarrhea occurs, the child starts malnourish and the, the growth is stunted. So there's a physical stunted growth, but also it affects the mental development. So this is indeed a serious issue in Asia Pacific countries and territories with a high prevalence of stunting among children. For instance, I can give you one example, Papua New Guinea has about 46% of children under five stunted. And one of the underlying causes is water scarcity and access to clean water. Water scarcity also affects the education. Because when water dries up, you know, the children have to leave school and especially the girls, they have to carry water, the physical burden on carrying water, uh, school dropout. And on top of that, there are risks of uh, exploitation, abuse uh, for, for girls. And when schools do not have adequate water, the students and the teacher cannot wash their hand and the school become not a very clean environment. So these are very much interlinked. And also water scarcity it's really impacting on children the most because in a, in a as uh, Yasmin mentioned that, you know, the global workforce 78% are highly dependent on water, agriculture for one, 
when a, a, a child is born and brought up in a, in a water scarce environment, there's a very limited opportunity, economic opportunity. Uh, and also, this is one of the factors for them to leave school and leave home. Water scarcity and youth unemployment together are among the root causes of uh, migration in this region. As we discuss around the world, there are challenges of COVID, conflict, climate crisis, impacting the, the children's today and their future. And I would like to highlight the, the, the impacts of the, the climate and water scarcity on, on children. Climate crisis is a child right crisis. Water scarcity also a child right crisis because access to water, it's, it's a basic human right. Today, neither of them is recognized as such. So we need to really work together, join hands to address the climate change and water insecurity globally. It is not only the right thing to do, but it is also a smart thing to do for the society, especially joining hand with the, with the private sector. We can only achieve water security for every child when the families and community have access to water, which is safe, reliable, affordable, and resilient to threats. So let me stop here and uh, hand it back to our moderator. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Mio. Um, uh, indeed, uh, more hard hitting facts and stats coming through from you. Uh, you know, just uh, this morning uh, in the newspapers in India, uh, uh, you know, uh, one article jumped up at me, which was five bacteria types claimed 680,000 lives in India alone in the year 2019. This is a Lancet report that was published. So, you know, I mean, if you look at the region and we look beyond, I think it is, it, it is, the, it is the biggest silent killer in the world today, contaminated water. Uh, you touched upon two other points, which I think are very pertinent, which is accessibility to water. I think accessibility, and that is, you know, I, I'd like to come in here and talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Janajal, a safe water enterprise that is trying to make safe water available to people, like I said initially. But what we're trying to do is really solve that accessibility problem. We believed very early that people should not need to walk to water. Water needs to roll to people. Water needs to show up at their doorstep, whether through a pipeline or in a decentralized manner. And that is exactly what we've done. We've gone out and built a technology enabled, um, you know, uh, decentralized last mile delivery of safe water, where we now go and deliver water to people's homes for as little as one cent US per liter. So, uh, you know, so that's, and you spoke about stunting. And stunting is something which often gets disregarded and ignored uh, or are unnoticed, but it is the greatest killer right now for our future, uh, future generations. It is the biggest problem that, that countries, communities, and regions are facing. And you know, often people blame it on genetics, people blame it on other aspects, but nobody attributes stunting to contaminated water. Uh, you know, the, the, in the east of India, there is a lot of arsenic prevalent in the water. And you'll be surprised that the least amount of recruitment in the Indian army happens from that region because no youngster passes the physical fitness test. They've got deformities, their bones are, uh, are fragile, their, you know, their joints are warped, and they just cannot make it because ever since they were born, they were consuming water that had arsenic in it and iron. So there, so there we are. But you know, and since um, you know, let me go back to Yasmin. Yasmin, uh, you know, uh, I know, I know you have to leave a little early, ahead of time. Uh, but so we, you know, which is why I'm coming back to you, uh, and because uh, and uh, you know, your 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 perspective is extremely valuable. I'm going to throw a point at you that I would like like you to really address here for the benefit of everyone, as I see it. And I'm not. I'm going to take full responsibility of this point for this point. The world is split into two, two parts. One is the institutional world, and then there is the real world. And I'm sorry I'm, call, I'm, I'm, I'm isolating the institutions from the real world, but I'm, what I'm trying to say here is, how do these two bridge? I mean, the Asian Development Bank is, is, uh, you know, is the boss uh, as far as development in Asia is concerned. How does the ADB really go out and percolate its solutions, its intentions, its approach on the ground. You know, please uh, enlighten us on that. Well, thank you, Dr. Parag, and, and again to our panelists um, for all of the comments they've been sharing. And I'm, I'm smiling because you called us the boss. So I, I, that's a nice uh, term to hear for us. 
but maybe just uh, coming back to the work that we do. Um, of course, as a development bank, financing is really one of our primary um, areas uh, that we focus on. But I would say it's it's the concept of finance plus the value addition. And you mentioned India, which um, for many years I was working on water projects in India, where we really had to demonstrate what what is the value addition we bring as a development bank. And I think that's very crucial uh, for all of us to consider. Now, I'd like to share exactly on that point, which links into your point about contaminated water. And I'm going to use an example to illustrate the value addition that we bring. Now, what we understand for the countries in Asia and the Pacific, we need to invest about an average of one to 2% of annual GDP of the region to achieve SDG six. Now, this is far beyond what the public sector and development assistance that as a development bank we could provide. And here's where I see that we play an important role as the bridge between public sector financing, development assistance, and importantly, the private sector, where we can leverage private sector financing and really bring that in to our developing member countries. We see that there's a huge untapped potential for the private sector in the water sector. And we believe that the private sector has been taking on a significant role uh, to develop technologies, uh, not just to enhance climate resilience, but overall all improve the operational efficiency of the sector, which as a byproduct reduces overall investment requirements. So ADB has a sovereign and non-sovereign um, operations windows under one overall corporate umbrella. And we work closely as a unified water sector so we expect investments in the water sector let's, in the next three years to remain at over 10 billion um, through this uh, one window. And we're going to be uh, looking at accomplishing this through multiple approaches, including knowledge, as I mentioned, very important area, policy dialogue and uh, finance and technical assistance. As an example, um, some countries which are opening up their water sector for private sector participation um, as an example is the People's Republic of China. And ADB has been supporting the government's regulatory framework and financing of the first public-private partnership project in 1991. So quite historical. And since then, we've been actively financing projects in water supply, including treatment and distribution, as you mentioned, the treatment for clean water and the distribution for what I would say water flowing to the consumer, to, to that beneficiary. We're also supporting wastewater treatment and its reuse, sludge, and most recently river and lake restoration, which are very important areas, um, as Dr. Mio pointed out as well, more from that ecosystem and biodiversity context. Um, I'm very pleased to share as well that in September this year, Tashkent City Municipality in Uzbekistan signed a 30-year PPP arrangement with Veolia Energy uh, Tashkent to upgrade, operate, and maintain the Tashkent district heating network for um, higher safety standards in the use of natural gas, energy, and water, which will be between 25 and 40% improvements. We also have the Namangan wastewater treatment plant in Uzbekistan. It's the first water and wastewater PPP project. So again, demonstrating how we can build partnerships with the private sector. And this project will improve water quality in the Sirdaria River, while also reducing greenhouse gas emissions through enhanced emission standards under 25 year PPP agreement um, with the utilities company. Um, so this is leveraging from the learning of ongoing projects and adding value building on them, um, where we can also take those type of uh, learnings and lessons to other cities. And we're very pleased with the government's willingness and readiness to support private sector investments in the water sector, which tend to vary country to country. But what I'm seeing are glimmers of hope. And where we have the winners, we could take those lessons to other countries as examples of how you can do it. So I'll stop there with those PPP examples. Thank you. And uh, my apologies to the panel, to yourself and the audience that I may need to now step out for another appointment. But thank you very much for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, um, uh, have a good one, and thank you very much for your comments, for your uh, for all these insights and inputs. Uh, you know, the ADB is doing path-breaking work, and please continue to do so. And uh, you know, let's have ADB uh, upgraded to WDB someday, the World Development <laughs> Bank. So, thank you very much, and uh, you know, have a good day. Uh, meanwhile, you know, just moving on, uh, you know, let me go to Catherine. Catherine, I have a question for you. Um, how important are profits in any water intervention related projects, in any projects that have water interventions? Uh, how, A is how important are profits? Often we've seen where projects are first evaluated for their profitability. And then a decision is taken whether it is important or not. My question uh, to everyone uh, in the world uh, has forever been, yes, it is important. Financial ROI is important. But what about impact ROI? What about other metrics that really drive, uh, drive a case uh, and make it uh, fundable, uh, if I can uh, call it? So how does, how does the Australian Water Partnership uh, you know, um, view uh, projects and you know what is it that uh, you would like to share uh, in uh, in that vein? Okay, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, profit is always is is a is a driver. Um, yeah, the need for economic development has been and always be a cha challenge um, in the water sector. Um, but there needs to be more strategic investment um, in development that minimizes impact. So, just building on that, that means understanding the value of the resource. So it's not just about the economic value. Um, it's also about the environmental, the social and cultural value. Um, so um, that could be through doing a cost benefit analysis, which reflects all values. So for example, um, last year, we um, supported a project actually in partnership with the World Bank um, uh, and water sensitive cities, Australia, as well as um, the Inter International Center on uh, Environmental Management which was looking at valuing nature-based solutions for integrated urban flood management. So specifically, um, uh, some work had been done in the past in, in China with the World Bank, where they had looked at a similar issue, which, which um, looked at how nature, well, again, how nature-based solutions could be part of flood management in an urban context. So this particular project, um, basically we, uh, the, the partners undertook uh, some case studies. They did an evaluation of case studies in Thailand and Vietnam. Um, in large cities and in smaller secondary cities. Um, and they worked with government officials to understand what were the values of economic, social, environmental, and, and cultural aspects. Um, and when they undertook a cost benefit analysis, basically what they were looking at, they were looking at um, approaches that were um, using conventional technologies or conventional approaches, for example, um, in terms of wastewater treatment or in terms of, uh, well, sorry, wastewater treatment combined with flood management. And then they looked at how um, just um, a hybrid approaches, which could include um, constructed wetlands, it could include um, expanding um, park areas, and found generally that the integration of nature-based solutions had overall benefits for, for stakeholders. Obviously, there are going to be trade-offs um, between stakeholders. Some, some, of the, some of the benefits might be to more to citizens. Um, some of the costs might be more to the municipality. But the overall benefit when integrating uh, nature-based solutions um, uh, was, was um, higher than just using um, the planned conventional approaches. Um, another example, um, and this is something we're about to launch next week at the International River Symposium. Um, we looked, we did um, a series of case studies on valuing water um, in the Murray-Darling Basin. So this was in order to provide um, an Australian perspective or, or the Australian perspective of the journey that has been undertaken in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, so it lo it's looked at the economic value under water scarcity, the environmental value, and also the cultural values. And has, uh, there's also a synopsis that has brought all those together. So it does provide the perspective and the importance of how these different types of values need to be considered when, when um, 
you know, when putting together um, projects or, um, you know, in future infrastructure that can supply water and sanitation, that can do flood management and can address water scarcity. So that, yeah, essentially my message is that you, you have to have a wider perspective than just the, the straight profits. Um, we've got to think about who, who the different stakeholders are, stakeholders are and who is um, going to benefit. Oh, you're on mute again. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm. I'm glad that uh, you know you agree with that approach. You know, I've all. Uh, I've all often said uh, sustainability of the projects itself should be more valuable than profitability. If the if if a project can generate enough revenue to remain sustainable and not demand more and more capital infusion on a recurring basis, I think that should be uh, that should be a green light for those projects to happen. So yes, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Dr. Mio, uh, let's go to you. Bernice, please bear with me. Uh, we are trying to now uh, make up for uh, having Dr. Mio uh, come in last on the, on the previous uh, round of discussions. Uh, Dr. Mio, I have a question for you. I mean, again, UNICEF, uh, you know, a torch bearer in the sector, how can businesses, financial institutions, and governments in the region best assist organizations like UNICEF I am now talking about assisting UNICEF because, and thereby placing you on a pedestal. Having said that, it's also important to understand that innovation, um, innovation of any kind, new technologies, uh, interventions, processes, uh, practices, is all happening largely on the private sector side. Therefore, it's important to marry the two. How will the world ever benefit from these innovations if organizations like UNICEF don't step up and support uh, interventions uh, uh, by applying those. So, you know, your thoughts on this, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal. Uh, just uh, to, to highlight that we are partners of, in this uh, development world and uh, we are partners to, to achieving the SDG. So we work closely as UNICEF, we work closely with the government. At the same time, increasingly, we are working with the, with the Financial international financial institutions such as uh, ADB, World Bank, and also AIIB, the newly established bank. And also, we are increasingly working closely with the private sector. UNICEF, traditionally, we used to work with government, NGOs, CSOs, uh, local, you know, faith based organization, private uh, media, communities, families, but increasingly our engagement with, uh, with the financial institutions and, uh, and uh, the private sector. We have really started, you know, a, a decade or so ago, uh, more more closely working with them. Um, to start with the with the financial institutions, as Yasmin mentioned, you know, ADB and many other, you know, the the the, the governments and the financial institution, they can really undertake huge projects, you know, such as uh, the, uh, the 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 water safety plan, and also um, mentioned about the wastewater management plan, huge huge projects where the government and the communities need the capacity to, to undertake. So one role that we are filling in is the capacity building of the government, helping them to plan policies are gender sensitive, community focus, et cetera, et cetera. So the government can really implement either the loans or the grants from the financial institutions such as ADB or, or, or World Bank. One example I can give you is we are working closely with the, the government of Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs under that they have this uh, technical cooperation directory. So we are working closely with them through technical cooperation directory. We work closely with the Singapore Water Academy and Singapore Water Board. So under this, they have a public ut utility board. Singapore, it's a good example because in the 60s and early 70s, you know, they are also resource poor, one of the resource poor country like many countries in the region and they really move up the ladder and develop well. So they have a lot of experiences they can share. So we started training the, the government officials in the region, and now the, the, the training become quite successful. We extended outside of the region. So some of the governments from, from Africa, Ghana, uh, you know, uh, West Africa, plus some East African country also joined. So we are really expanding. This is one way of building the government capacity to utilize fully the available resources made by the financial institution. Also, I want to highlight a bit on on uh, on our work with the with the private sector. So, private sector, you know, um, it's also very important in 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 our work because if you look at the community level, if you look at the government level, 
private sector has certain influence in in the uh, in the decision making of uh, what type of you know the water uh, services they need you know what are the the, the service provider etc cetera, etc cetera. but uh, what, what some of the key things that i want to highlight in this working with the private sector first i think private sector can be a model uh, you know so private sector company can really offer safe drinking water private and functional toilets and facilities for hand washing with soap and supplies for menstrual hygiene uh, for for women or girls working so that this essential service for their own staff could really provide and this is something that you know um supporting the health well-being of of its own staff in the private sector so the private sector company can can play as a role model in in the water sanitation and hygiene sector and also private sector produce water sanitation hygiene goods and services so what we can do and we've been doing is really expanding the market access and targeting the products and services that needs for the the need of the the most vulnerable community so what are the products and services that are accessible affordable and durable so that you know we can reach out to them and also vice versa private sector can reach out to us sometimes you know we support the government to to select sometimes you know we have some funding that we could work closely with the private sector you know uh, the, the production manufacturing um so that you know we could really uh, support each other in a common goal in achieving water and sanitation one of the example is is the expansion of uh, solar power hub you know we we did it successfully in in the west and central africa uh, of course this the the this is a good amount of sunshine there and definitely the region also you know we are working closely increasingly there's an enormous opportunity for the private sector in solar because solar can really open the new markets increase the range of professional services from designing installation operation maintenance quality assurance etc cetera, etc cetera. it's on it's not only for the water services water pumping etc cetera, etc cetera, but also could provide some lighting for the schools heating for the schools health centers you know uh, some of the health centers in rural areas may not have access to electricity so this is something that you know we could really uh, work closely and also uh, a businesses and private sector you know uh, the social responsibility you mentioned corporate social responsibility for the climate and environment so that's also one area that you know we could work closely assess and reduce uh, the environmental impact of the private sector to ensure and protect the water quality and health of the community that you serve and you work so i think that's also one way of uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emission you know uh, reducing air pollution so these are the areas that uh, we could work closely and we are working in places like mongolia and also china you know working with a few private sector companies finally i just want to want to mention that uh, water sanitation hygiene the investment is really highly cost effective for every dollar we we spend i'm sure there will be many studies but uh, i understand that every dollar we spend 4 to 5 dollars in economic returns because we increase the productivity health of the population and especially the young people uh, the future of the of the nation so let me stop here and uh, give you back the floor Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is wonderful. You know, it's very good to hear of all the 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 openness and the um, uh, the malleability. Uh, you know, uh, at at the UNICEF's end, and I'm sure this will embolden a lot of uh, listeners here, a lot of our attendees, to basically write to you. So watch out for your inbox being, uh, uh, you know, being overloaded with a lot of mails coming in. But I'm sure they'll reach out, and and I would look forward to seeing more interventions supported by UNICEF. Uh, you spoke about capacity building and Berenice. Uh, you know, you've worked so closely, you continue to work so closely with uh, the private sector. So while on one hand, organizations like UNICEF, ADB, Australian Water Partnership are working to build capacity, what about capacity utilization? Is the capacity utilization happening enough? You know, so again, from where I sit, uh, community level water treatment plants globally ha have a capacity utilization of less than 10%. This is a this is a stat that I, I'm submitting here. What so? How much sense does it make to continue to build capacity and completely disregard the utilization of that capacity? So does it make isn't utilization of capacity a more cost effective way of leveraging existing water infrastructure and taking water, safe water or water to the world? Your thoughts, please. 
Okay, well, so so that's uh, well, actually, that's a difficult question. Uh, I mean, obviously, yes, it, it makes a, it makes a lot of sense to uh, to to optimize the the uh, utili the uh, utilization of existing capacity. Uh, but but I think uh, so. I, I was actually not aware of, of the data that you you brought up, and I'm, I must say I'm a little bit shocked uh, to see that uh, that that uh, existing infrastructures are are so underutilized. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, there's a, I mean, going back to, to the role that the, the private sector can take, I think, I mean, there's a, a lot of interesting points that were made uh, in, in, in the discussion today uh, about the, uh, well, first of all, the, the tremendous commercial opportunities, uh, which were, uh, you know, mentioned more than once uh, for the private sector uh, to take an important role in uh, public-private partnerships uh, to support uh, the extension of access to clean water uh, and sanitation. And so, so obviously that's one, but here we're looking at, uh, at certain macro projects. I think what's really important, especially if you're talking about uh, capacity building, is, is for companies to understand that uh, it's not just the, you know, the companies that work in uh, water and sanitation uh, that can play a role in uh, water conservation. Uh, it's really something that all companies should uh, look into and should do, because uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, most companies depend uh, either directly or indirectly on water uh, and have impacts on water. Uh, and I think, Catherine, you made a, a very critical point. Uh, water scarcity is not priced. Uh, and so that is one of the key reasons, I think, uh, why you know a lot of companies uh, are not necessarily uh, uh, paying attention to, to this issue uh, because the uh, cost of the uh, impacts of water scarcity or even the, uh, uh, the uh, opportunity or uh, value of having access uh, to plentiful uh, resources of, of, uh, of clean water uh, is not priced. And so therefore it's not accounted for in financial calculations for projects. Um, so, so just going back to you know why uh, companies uh, should uh, should take action uh, in this area, uh, and so number one, we've mentioned the opportunities, uh, but also uh, I think ultimately uh, what is important to remember is that you know water management uh, will become a, a material issue uh, for companies uh, with impacts that can be uh, financially material. And so uh, let, let me develop that idea a little bit. I think here uh, we've looked at the opportunities, we need to look at the risks as well. So, uh, so if you look at dependencies on water, and as we've mentioned, companies are all dependent on water at some point in their value chain. Um, here, the risks are mostly related to uh, supply chain resilience. Uh, and so currently, you know, across the world, uh, water stress levels are uh, relatively safe. Uh, so we're, we're looking at an average of approximately 20%. But as we've mentioned earlier on this panel, uh, in Asia, uh, and more particularly in uh, Southern and Central Asia, we're already registering a very high level of water stress at almost 75%. Uh, and obviously, climate change is, is compounding this issue. It's primarily a, a water crisis. So uh, it's increasing, uh, it's increasing uh, water stress, but you also have you know, extreme water events that are uh, contaminating uh, water sources and making them unavailable for consumption uh, and also for corporate usage. Uh, you have changes in water cycle that will affect the production of electricity, uh, agriculture as well. Uh, it will have an impact on, you know, the type of crops that can be grown, where these crops can be grown. So all of that will have uh, significant impacts uh, on, on corporate activities. And so from that perspective, uh, it's extremely important for companies to understand uh, how and where they depend on water and uh, what are some of the risks related to that. Now, if we look at their impacts, uh, we've mentioned you know, earlier uh, that, you know, that in, a, in an environment where water uh, is, is increasingly scarce uh, and, uh, and important for uh, health and sanitation, but also for food security and energy security, um, obviously, I mean, there will be uh, more and more scrutiny of how water is being used by, by companies. Uh, and there are growing discussions about making companies more accountable for their uh, water usage. So it's really important from a risk management perspective to 
you know, to mitigate reputational or regulatory or even risk, uh, legal risks uh, for companies to be very much aware of, uh, of how uh, they are uh, engaging with water. Um, and, and finally, just in relations to uh, points that have been made earlier uh, about the SDGs and, and climate change, I think there's, there's an additional set of risks for companies that come from the uh, very close interrelation uh, between uh, climate change and water scarcity. So as we have seen, uh, water scarcity uh, is, is uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change, sorry, uh, is, is, is contributing to, uh, to water scarcity. But uh, conversely, water scarcity is actually aggravating climate change. Uh, so, you know, it is, uh, it is impacting uh, critical uh, water dependent carbon sinks. Uh, and we now know that if we want to limit the effects of climate change, uh, not only do we need to uh, limit uh, carbon emissions, but we also need to uh, rely on nature-based solutions for carbon capture and storage. So from a company perspective, companies are now pledging to take action on uh, climate change. So, uh, so inevitably, at some points, uh, they will be asked to also take action on water. Uh, and as, as you have mentioned, uh, previously, uh, there is a very strong correlation uh, between uh, between water conservation uh, and, uh, and and a number of SDGs. So obviously, there's an SDG as well, uh, there is an SDG on water conservation. But if you look at the the backdrop uh, behind me, I've actually listed a number of the uh, a number of SDGs that are uh, directly dependent on uh, the availability of of water for for being met. And so again, uh, corporations are expected or are pledging uh, to help to support uh, progress in achieving the SDGs. And so from that perspective, uh, there will be some, uh, some, some necessary accountability. Uh, so, so really what I'm saying here is that obviously, you know, large companies have, have a critical role to play uh, in, in supporting and particularly utility companies and companies in water and sanitation have a critical role to play uh, in supporting uh, access to water projects, uh, and, and many of them are already doing that. But every company, uh, whether they're big or small, uh, and working directly in, uh, in, in, in the water sector or not, should really uh, pay attention to their impacts and dependencies on water uh, and take action to uh, mitigate those impacts and reduce those dependencies. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Bernice. That was extremely insightful. And, uh, um, you know, I have to say, um, you know, uh, this has been this has been a this has been a huge learning curve for me personally. And I'm sure all of us have uh, have benefited from this discussion. All of, all of the listeners, all our attendees have benefited from this discussion. We are we are almost at the end of uh, the, the the time that we were allocated, and I want to round up. You know, pretty much, uh, it's difficult to summarize this entire discussion. It's been so wide, so deep that uh, it's difficult to summarize it. But I'm going to just speak on behalf of the uh, the private sector. Here and I'm I'm talking to all the organizations and the institutions that they may be, is please try and develop a common qualifying uh, metric to, to enable private sector companies to work with yourselves. I think uh, you know I'll give the example of a a, uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, citizen, a U.S. passport holder, who can travel to 180 countries without needing a visa. Uh, a, a Singaporean passport holder can travel to 194 countries without needing a visa. Why can't a, 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 a standard, a gold standard be developed where, where organizations say, okay, if you worked with X, Y, Z, then you also qualify to work with us. And if those can be developed and thrust into, into, uh, into implementation, I can assure you that you will find a lot of value coming through from the private sector. Uh, that will actually make your intentions and ambitions more meaningful. I mean, I say this not only to our panelists here, but also to all the others who, who are on the backdrop, who are, in the attend who are attendees here, and who will listen to this, uh, this webinar in due course uh, over time, that please try and let's try and build this because that will create the bridge between the two worlds, the two silos that I spoke about initially. Uh, I thank each one of you 
um, profusely for, uh, for your time, for the wealth of information, knowledge, and experience that you've shared over here with us. Uh, uh, Michael, if you're still there, uh, uh, you know, uh, please come in and uh, advise us on, uh, you know, any next steps. But uh, let's, um, yeah, I just have a comment here uh, that the, the from Dr. Mio that the UN has a mutual recognition pact among UN agencies for such, which is great. But let's, uh, I'm, I'm just asking them to extend it to the private world as well, to the private sector world. That'll, that'll be immensely meaningful. Uh, so thank you very much, gentlemen uh, uh, and ladies. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. It's been a privilege. And uh, uh, let's continue to remain in, in, in the other sessions and um, look forward to staying connected with all of you. Thank you. Very thank, much. thank you, Dr. Parag. Thank you, panelists, for a very insightful uh, discussion on everything about the water industry, the water economy. So, yeah, that's it for now. So we'll say goodbye to our panelists. And uh, but stay tuned, because in just 15 minutes, we start our one to one dialogues kicking off, uh, looking at it through a Hong Kong lens, success stories within APAC. And uh, then we have going around the region. So we're going to be looking at um, Singapore, which was mentioned there earlier by UNICEF, Australia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and finishing up uh, India just before dinner time. So don't be shy if you want to continue um, staying online. Just come, as we come out of this webinar, go back to the virtual lobby and you can join any of the live sessions this afternoon. And that will be it for now. So thank you to all our panelists. Have a great day and take care for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.